have for improvements to our system and some of the things that we've talked about in light of the possibility that the town may be able to cooperate with a neighboring town in terms of delivery of water and delivery of sewer services. Um, that's East Hampton, which is Joe Courtney's district. And we've right. off and on, John, we've had conversations with them, um, but I just wanted Mary to give us an overview of that because Mary has worked sure. closely with our Water and Sewer Commission, of which we have three members here today. Our chairman, Dick Cody, is here, and he's seated in the back, along with Norm Ward and Dave Kosminski. So that's a quorum of Water and Sewer Commission. And then for the selectmen, um, Jim Tripp and I are here. Our town clerk, Ryan Curley, is here. Um, am I missing anybody? I think I included everybody. Um, so we don't have a quorum of the Board of Selectmen, but some of them will be joining us on Zoom. on Zoom. So that'll be good. And let me think, is there something else I wanted to mention? We do have a water and sewer subcommittee of the Board of Selectmen. And I'm also gonna have Jim Tripp, um, who's seated next to me, give an overview of some of the work we've been doing. Sure. Now, I know the American Rescue Plan includes a lot more than just water, sewer, and infrastructure of that nature. So um, we're gonna start with having Congressman Larson go to the podium so we can hear you well. And I think you are planning to give us an overview of the American Rescue Plan. Yes. Welcome, Congressman Larson. Nice to have you in Portland today. Well, it's good to be back in uh, Portland and uh, be able to always, when I come here, reflect on my great-grandparents, uh, Lars Larson and Marie Peterson. Lars, who worked at the Brownstone Quarry, uh, and Marie, who was, uh, uh, I think she lived in Middletown, and then, uh, but they ended up on Diggins Avenue. Yeah. And... Uh, uh, where a lot of uh, Swedish immigrants ended up at the time, and uh, then ultimately moved to uh, uh, to Hartford, et cetera. But uh, I can remember telling my father, having grown up in Mayberry Village, a federal housing project, that I said, geez, I went down to Diggins Avenue. And I said, Dad, we haven't come very far from Diggins Avenue to Mayberry Village. And uh, he always got a little chuckle out of that. But uh, um, Always happy to be here, and uh, Susan, thank you You're and welcome. the selectmen for inviting me. And we've been going around the district uh, during this time, uh, primarily uh, to make sure that everyone understands the significance of the American Rescue Plan. Uh, this is probably the largest amount of money coming directly to communities, the state, and people mm -hmm. since the New Deal. And uh, we've been prevailing upon everyone, and I, I thank you, Mayor, you've been outstanding in this, in making sure that citizens in the district understand that they are eligible because there's so many credits that are eligible. And uh, most people were, have probably received their stimulus check electronically, and it showed up in your uh, bank account. But there are a lot of people who are what we would call non-filers, uh, people who didn't make enough money to um, uh, file a tax form, and others who uh, simply don't bank electronically, et cetera. The bottom line is this, any individual, single individual making less than $75,000 and a married couple making less than $150,000 are eligible for all the benefits in this program. Uh, and for the first time, uh, we lifted the um, ban on the earned income tax credit so that people over age 65 are entitled to benefits as well. People that are on social security are entitled to benefits. Some may have already got them depending upon how you receive your social security but we hear story after story of people getting a check or not knowing what the check was for, et cetera. So we're out there prevailing on our elected uh, uh, town officials uh, to assist us 
uh, and, and if someone you know, uh, a family member, a neighbor, uh, someone that you work with, et cetera, may or may not have gotten uh, their stimulus check, may be eligible for the new child tax credit, the earned income tax credit, the child care tax credit, if they're a renter and we're behind in their rent because of COVID, up to $10,000. Now that will go to the landlord, but it's back rent as well as payments for utilities. Anyone that was impacted by COVID, God forbid, passed away. Funeral expenses are also within this American rescue plan. As are, as was indicated, infrastructure plans, et cetera, because the towns, as you know, in Portland, all receive uh, checks from the federal government, uh, both in terms for education and then also for the municipality. Now they do come with some strings, uh, but nonetheless, uh, this is vital money that uh, communities needed. And we really believe that our local selectmen and women and boards know how to better distribute that money than the federal government does. And, uh, and you all have needs, you all have been tightening your budgets as we've gone through COVID. And so what we wanted to do is to make sure that money was getting out to our municipalities who have uh, uh, persevered uh, throughout this, uh, what is a global pandemic and still persists, uh, even as uh, Connecticut, and I wanna commend Governor Lamont for the incredible job that he's done. It's nice when you're down in Washington and you get to brag about your state being in the top five of states all across this country who have addressed the COVID pandemic. So what we like to say about this uh, proposal is that it put shots in people's arms, including the first time ever national vaccine program uh, that the Biden administration has now kicked off. Uh, and there's still an ongoing effort. I'm sure it's taking place here in Portland as well to make sure that uh, as the goal is to reach herd immunity uh, to stop the spread of COVID-19 and protect everyone. And we're at a point, and it's great to be at a hearing where you're not wearing a mask, uh, but that's probably, I would guess, that probably everybody in this room has been vaccinated. Uh, and that's an, that's an important thing also. There's still a lot of work to be done. I'm meeting later uh, this afternoon in North Hartford with uh, Mothers Against Violence and where people haven't, you know, taken full advantage of a number of the things in the American Rescue Plan. But the first thing was to put vaccination in people's arms, put money back in their wallets. Why? Well, as you all know, the unemployment and people being shut down or working at home during this, this time, the loss was uh, incredible. But the feeling is that by putting this money back, and this is not just the feeling of Congress, this is the feeling of the Fed and also of Janet Yellen and others who have said, what we need to do is make sure that we're spending back into the economy. And where do you need to spend that money? Back in your local communities. That's why the checks have gone to both the education and the town and to individuals as well. Because those individuals aren't hoarding the money and going out and cashing in on stock options. They're buying the necessities of life so that they can get by. And again, as I was saying earlier, it's our sincere hope that if you know of people who are eligible and haven't applied, uh, we want to make sure that every citizen who's eligible is aware and we're able to assist them. That includes a lot of single moms and others who are struggling on their own and not everybody is in tune to C-SPAN or 
goes online to figure out what's going on, a lot of people are up to their ears and struggling just to make ends meet, and many of them single mothers with children. And so the tax credits that are available for them are vitally important, up to uh, $3,600 for a child under six years of age and $3,000 for a child over that age. All again in an in effort to make sure that in our own Rosa DeLauro from New Haven is the chief author of that bill. It came through the Committee on Ways and Means that I serve on and I was happy to shepherd it through through the for the deaness of our delegation as we like to refer to Rosa, but she's, that's something she's been working on for 18 years. The good news is that that tax credit alone will lift more than 50% of all the children who are living in poverty out of poverty. Uh, there can be no greater goal than uh, making sure that we continue to uh, focus on this, not just during this time of the COVID pandemic, uh, but beyond uh, as well. <clears throat> we also have been focused on, you know, making sure that we're getting kids back to school. And so that's why every community, as uh, you noted, Mayor, earlier, is going to get a separate check for education and education concerns. Uh, and uh, we think that this is vitally important as well because of a lot of the missed time that kids went through because of the uh, because of the pandemic. And also, as we uh, look out towards the next phase or what we call the infrastructure plan that the president has proposed, and it's our sincere hope that we get bipartisan support on this because there's nothing ideological about a bridge, about waterworks, about uh, roads, about broadband, about schools, et cetera. These are all things that, uh, well, you know the record here in this country. Engineers have given the infrastructure of the United States a D minus rating. Uh, and, um, you know, we are inside of the Aragone Bridge and inside of the Connecticut River. And we're going to hear later about uh, water issues that Portland is grappling with. These all need federal attention. These are infrastructure issues that go beyond the ability of a local community to grapple with it and make it uh, come to fruition. And what does that do as well? Well, of course, it puts America back to work. <clears throat> and that's the main goal here, is to make sure that we're putting uh, Americans back to work. So vaccinations in your arms, money in your pocket, kids back in their seats, people back to work and communities receiving the aid that they desperately need, both from a municipal standpoint and from an educational standpoint, because that's where the identified needs are. As always, it's an honor to represent the people of the first district and the people of, the, of uh, my ancestral home of Portland, uh, because of Lars Larson and Marie Peterson, it's uh, good to be back here today. I, I'm anxious to hear what you have to say about your project with respect to uh, uh, the water issues that you face here in, um, in Portland. And again, we hope with the passage of the infrastructure plan, there'll be monies available currently for that, as well as I believe it is a recognized use uh, with regard to the money that uh, Portland received. There will be a smaller check coming too for because uh, there's a county government and we fought to get this as a state that does not have county government anymore, but other states do. They received county checks as well. So, uh, but Portland will be receiving a county check. It'll be based primarily on population and size, et cetera. But uh, as uh, 
uh, Lars Larson would say, never look a uh, gift horse in the mouth and uh, make sure that we get uh, uh, what's uh, coming to all of our municipalities and our, our people. And with that, Your Honor, I'll turn the floor back over to you and um, anxiously await what you have to say. And uh, my staff is here as well, Maureen uh, Moriarty and, and uh, Connor right. Quinn Great. are both in the back. And uh, we're here to uh, help and assist, or as uh, our good friend Billy Seattle would say, uh, how can we help you? And uh, that's our job and that's our role and responsibility. Thank you for having me this well, it's morning. it's great to have you, Congressman. Thank you. <clears throat> what I wanted to say is that if our folks wanted to go to the podium, you can, or we can just have it at our tables here, whichever you prefer. So um, it's uh, a great opportunity. Thank you for coming to Portland again. You come often, um, Congressman, and it's just nice that we've uh, been able to get a group of us together to focus a bit on one of our key infrastructure needs. It's something we've identified over the years, something we work every day at, and that is providing good clean water and also cleaning water um, to return it clean to the Connecticut River through our sewer division. I thought we would start, um, we'll keep it somewhat informal, and we'll start with Bob Shea. Uh, Bob is the Director of Public Works John, and that includes not only everything associated with traditional public works, but also the water division and the sewer division of the town of Portland. Bob is also our fire chief and has been the fire chief for nearly 18 years. So he comes with a lot of experience. Um, he is a degreed engineer, has a lot of experience in the area of manufacturing, as well as public works and public safety. So. I'm going to turn it to Bob to give us an overview of the needs we have and maybe boast a little bit about the good job that our employees do in this area. Thank you, thank you Susan, and thank you for being here, John. Um, you know, we can go on for hours related to both of the topics. Uh, water and sewer are just a critical portion of what we do, probably the most critical departments that I have, um, simply due to health on both ends. So it's something that we um, are, are proud of. Uh, Jim Lynch is here. Um, he's my supervisor. He's been here for an awful long time, uh, over 30 years, Jim, I think. And he's been running the, uh, um, the wastewater department and does a wonderful job, and we're very happy to have him. Uh, it's a challenge. Water and sewer is a challenge. Uh, people forget that um, as much water as you use, um, a majority of it, a very large percent, ends up at Jim's plant. Um, it needs to be treated and it goes the other way. So we forget often how close those tie together and how critical they are. So at the front end is, is the safest, cleanest water that we can provide to our customers. And on that other side is how we can treat that wastewater and protect our environment by doing so. So we fight those challenges every day. Um, here in Portland, um, our water department has over 41 miles of pipe that is underground. Um, some of that pipe uh, dates back to uh, 1889. That's still in the ground. So, um, you know, with that said, we have another 22 miles of sewer that started early in the 1900s. That is original pipe as well. So as far as infrastructure, we're very old. Um, we try to make improvements to our infrastructure. We have for years but we still have an awful lot to do. And it's a great challenge financially to make those changes. Um, you know, we're, we're, we're constantly, you know, looking to make improvements and increase and remove pipe. Some of that, it's very difficult, very costly. So, you know, moving forward with the rescue plan, it was a pleasure to see that some of the priorities that were put on this plan were that of infrastructure and that of water and wastewater, I think, probably two of the most critical things that, you know, we have to provide to our community and our residents. Um, you know, being on the safety side, you know, water is a fire suppression uh, need as well. People forget that. Without water in general uh, to be able to be supplied, um, you, we can't protect property and life. So that goes hand in hand with, you know, what we try to do as well. So we have an awful lot to do. 
we have an awful lot to fix and, and improve on. Um, and with that said, to improve our infrastructure for the future ability to expand it. The only way that you can find resources or revenue to expand your current infrastructure is to be able to add more customers, mm. which is critical. And by doing so, we have a great need to make sure that our infrastructure is newer, is maintained, and is protected so that we can add those additional customers somehow in the future and not have any critical issues related to that. And that gets down to what's under the ground. At our sewer plant, at our pump stations, which we have three of that move wastewater um, through low areas up to you know gravity areas. So. You know, we've done our work as, as we can as a small community with the funding that's available. And we're looking to make improvements on, on those. And some of them were governed by, by law. That we have to meet certain criteria. We have to meet those each and every day with testing um, and the ability to do that. Some of those are difficult. They're, they're getting hard to reach those goals because we need to make those changes to that infrastructure, which is very critical. We certainly want to be able to supply the water that we have in the future. We wanna find new resources for water so that we can make sure that those resources or that available water and the volume that's needed as we expand our community is available for those who need it. And we were able to treat it on the other end. And you know, we go through phases where I've come in three years ago and I see the tail end of improvements that we made 20 years ago. We're here today. We have to make those improvements again because the plants and the facilities are that much older at the 20 year mark and we're required by law and by many regulations that are, you, you know, as well as I do, John, that are coming down each and every year, new, more strict regulations on our water, strict regulations on our sewer and how we process waste. And we need to be able to upgrade our systems to do that. So. We have a lot of opportunity. Uh, I'm looking forward that we can aggressively pursue, pursue funding for both departments to see if we can make those improvements and, and, and better our system here. And, you know, possibly in the future, you know, provide opportunities for communities around us um, that are struggling as we know we've worked on and we've talked about for years. Um, many communities around us are struggling for, for not only water, but sewer as well and to be able to meet those criteria that have been set forth by deep and dph um, as regulations to to make sure we're doing our job so i think in a nutshell that's that's what we struggle with each and every day um, every day is a different story every phone call is a different issue related to the two departments um, but i can't say enough about the small crews that we have we run our water department with two individuals Pretty unheard of. Um, and I think we do what we can. With that said, we have a whole highway division that backs up um, that department and all our other departments um, in an emergency um, or any other time that they need to. So we have a good team of employees that work well together. Thankfully, I couldn't do it without them. Um, one of them is here with us today. The other one, unfortunately, is off. But, uh, you know, they all work together. And uh, with that said, you know, we look forward to making improvements in the future and use, utilizing some of this funding um, for this critical portion of what we do each and every day. So thank you for being here. Thank you for the bills and pushing those through. And hopefully we'll be talking in the future. Look forward to that. Yeah, that's great. Can I ask thank a question? Sure, sure. go ahead, John. <clears throat> um, so currently, though, you uh, is the MDC the... Uh, it is, and we currently have a contract for water right. um, under um, a contract. It's a 30 year contract. I think it's sunlights in about three years. We're getting three to four years. We're getting towards the tail end of our contract and they provide very good quality water, um, about two thirds of our water. We have a contract for 146 million gallons. It's a, it's a minimum per year. It's a, it's a take or pay uh, contract. And uh, we keep our numbers pretty close to that. Um, sometimes it's difficult. Uh, last year's drought was difficult. You know, we, as well as many communities, ended up uh, needing more water uh, than our well. We have a well that uh, we subsidize that source with. And, you know, wells run dry. Many didn't in the state. Ours still produced, but, you know, we're very careful about what we use. 
So we did use a little more water than, you know, we, we had planned on using, but those things happen. But, you know, we're very uh, grateful that we have that interconnection with MDC, something that we did years ago because we, we were forced and needed to do that. Um, but, you know, we're looking to, to grow, to see, you know, what we can do and not, not lose that interconnection, but be able to provide more water to our residents, you know, using our abilities. I'm always struck by the fact that something we take for granted mm -hmm. is such a important asset and so little understood by people who are used to turning on the faucet or, or flushing the toilet and uh, things just happen magically. But um, I was up in Bar Campstead in Winstead, you know, and got to look at the, you know, reservoir system up there, et cetera. But uh, the precious nature of water, my next door neighbors in East Hartford are farmers. They've been farming the same piece of property for almost 400 years. And uh, they say the irrigation issues, et cetera. And uh, as you mentioned, the drought of last year and all the other issues that again, people take lightly because they're just used to turning on the faucet and the water appears. And uh, uh, a lot of work goes into it. It'd be interesting to see, especially we're hopeful that this uh, infrastructure package, which will have water in it, as you pointed out, the American Rescue Plan had, is, had money in that as well. But um, also, as we get down the line too, in working with our municipalities, the idea that uh, Rosa Deloro is now introducing earmarking again, I think will be vitally important. Earmarking from the standpoint that uh, local communities within a congressional district can apply uh, for monies, et cetera, as will be the case with the infrastructure money that will come into the state. So we're, we look forward to working with you on that because it's such a uh, overlooked, but clearly it's nothing more vitally important. I loved uh, your description of the, uh, you know, the safety that's attached with that, with the, to be able to uh, suppress fires and uh, just amazing. Thank you. We also have members of our water and sewer commission here, and I don't know if they wanted to make a comment. I don't really have a say. I just say we've been kind of dormant uh, with this fire Sounds good. And I love water resources. We're always working to look at water resources and how we can improve them. Even if we can only put a few dollars in the water bill, that's what we're going to do. Okay. Thank you. 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 Yeah. Dave, did you have anything you wanted to add? Sure. Uh, you know, basically, I, I serve uh, with with Norm and, and uh, uh, Dick on the on the Water Commission as well as uh, Jim Tripp on the uh, Water Advisory Committee. But again, um, you know, our issue basically, I'm also chair of the Connecticut Section AWWA Sustainability Committee. So again, to to try to become more sustainable and it's, it's critical from our standpoint in relation to uh, our MDC connection is that, um, you know, that we can produce uh, our own water uh, much cheaper, but, you know, to have that as, as, as a backup. Uh, and I think that's kind of where we need to be. But uh, also, as you know, uh, John, our, uh, our neighbors to the east, our uh, East Hampton, Heber and Marlboro, uh, again, are uh, in dire need of that. And I, I think we can, play a bigger part and a bigger role and working with the health department and the American rescue plan. And I think Mary can talk about that a little bit as far as in relation to, uh, being able to get a, a pipeline, uh, out that way too. But thank you uh, again. Thank you for being here. Um, to add to the discussion, I wanted, uh, the chairman of the, within the board of select and there's seven of us congressmen 
and we have a lot of work to do. And one of the things, of course, is water and sewer. So we've assigned a subcommittee of the selectmen to work with the Water and Sewer Commission and our staff. And it's made up of Jim Tripp, who's the chairman, along with um, Rick Shar and also Ralph Zampano. I don't know if they're here by Zoom, Nick? No, no they're not. So um, the only member of the committee that uh, is the chairman, and I wondered if Jim would give a brief overview of how sure. we've been working hard to do that. Sure, happy to do so. Um, thank you for coming today. It's good to see you. Um, about Basically, about three years ago, uh, we formed the, the subcommittee, and a lot of it had to do with working with the, um, the Water and Sewer Commission uh, we knew that we had to have more of a focus on these issues, the way that they were, um, the way some of the issues were progressing. When we talk about the biggest issue, it's going to be funding coming forward. When we take a look at what's happened now is we get two thirds of our water, as Bob said, from MDC. We get one third from our, our own well. When we look at the cost of that, it costs us roughly fifty to $100,000 a year, depending on how you allocate manpower, to produce that one third of our water. This year, our budget is $857,000 for the other two thirds. Back in 2015, that was $467,000. We've seen an 83% increase in that cost just over the last six years, 40, over 42% over three year period alone. So the, what we're seeing is that when we start looking at staffing issues and the fact that we only have two folks uh, that are working in our water department and we know we need more. When we look at the fact we have old infrastructure and we need to do a lot of work on it and we know we need to do more than we do, but we have also to be respectful of our, our ratepayers and trying to cover the costs of, of operating the system, um, doing the work we absolutely have to do and looking at the increases um, that we've been sustaining in, in, on the overall cost model, that's, um, um, there's a lot of things that are in tension there. We've looked at a lot of different options over the last few years, and the conclusion is we need to find our own water source. We have a $250,000 grant from the Department of Public Health that we're working on implementing now to help us um, to locate some sources, and we've got some very high potential sources in Portland. Once we locate and we verify what's there from a source standpoint and that it's clean, it's gonna be, you know, okay, done funding for infrastructure, et cetera. Those are the, like the, the next steps that we're gonna, we're gonna have to do. Um, as we do that in the short term, that will help you know, everybody who's on the system in terms of helping to bring some costs down a little bit, get the, the, the cost model shifted to something that's more sustainable and more predictable. Right now, the cost that's coming to us is not something we have any control over. But as we, you know, that, so in the short term, we look at how we can develop our own water source. 2026 is when our contract expires uh, with, with MDC. We need to have infrastructure in place by 2025 is a good goal at the latest. We certainly don't want to, to, to bleed over. Um, but then as we're looking at getting the cost model shifted, we look at some of the challenges in the Route 66 corridor. As the first select woman indicated, we've had some conversations with our neighbors to the east and along that Route 66 corridor, which is East Hampton, Marlboro, heading up to Hebron, we know there are water challenges. Our neighbor directly to East has some significant water challenges. So if we're able to solve some of the challenges we have here and provide water in a more cost-effective manner and in quantity, that's also going to allow us to help support with maybe some assistance pipeline-wise getting to East Hampton and along the entire 66 corridor. It'll help all the ratepayers. It'll help our businesses. And it'll help everybody again along what we, we kind of think of as that Route 66 corridor. Understood. Thank you. Uh, the other person I wanted to um, speak today, uh, Congressman, is Mary Dickerson. She's our town planner, and she um, has worked with all of these different groups as well as our region. And I thought Mary could highlight some of the things. Thank from your perspective. So I wear a number of hats: um, economic development coordinator town planner, land use administrator. And one of the things that I've really been focused on is working regionally to reduce our costs. So our River Cog has done a number of planning studies and we've done a land use plan. We've done a housing, we're in the middle of a housing plan. We've done a regional POCD. And when you look at the communities in our region that are fairly stable financially, they all have the same thing that we have and that is water and sewer. 
It brings economic development. It allows for tighter development of homes, residential development. It allows towns to run their schools and, and town buildings more effectively. However, that infrastructure is aging. And what I get phone calls from most commonly is who do I call about my water bill? I can't pay this. And I, you know, my family goes back to the sandbank under the bridge working for the quarry. It breaks my heart for people that I've known my entire life that go back generations in this town to say, I don't know if I can stay. And then we have the same problem attracting business. Business is coming in, they're looking at the cost of water and sewer. And they're looking at the cost of electricity and they're looking at the cost of insurance and they're looking at the cost of property. And in order for us to bring down the cost of our water and sewer to our users and to expand our user base, we need to, as Bob said, address our infrastructure. We need to have reliable infrastructure that doesn't have downtime. And that, that's really highly impactful to business. And they're looking at that. They're looking at the number of water main breaks. They're looking at interruptions in service that impacts their business tremendously and it impacts their decision-making when they're choosing where to go. That being said, these increases that Jim alluded to, we have no control over price increases. And so when someone's water bill goes up 150 to $250 a quarter, that's $1,000 a year. And you add that to the increased tax costs, you add that to the increased cost of medical insurance, you add that to the increased cost of homeowner's insurance. People aren't getting raises that are covering these continued fixed cost increases. And the reality is I belong to a group of economic developers in the region. We are all having the same problem and we need help. But the help cannot come from our rate payers. 22 to 2,400 people in Portland cannot carry the burden of infrastructure costs to expand their economic development to hopefully reduce their overall costs. And so that's where we work as economic developers to, to look to each other. How do we put together a proposal? How do we put together a package that's impactful to our own communities where we support each other? And Jim alluded to it, East Hampton has a water issue. They have not enough water and they have poor quality water. Marlboro has the same issue. So you go farther out 66, Marlboro would like to do more economic development. They just have a new grocery store. They have a, a clinic for Middlesex Hospital. They would like to develop that town center. They need water. And then you go to Hebron where there has almost been a halt on development because they don't have enough water. They put in an assisted living facility and now they really have maxed out their water capacity. So all of these things come back to how do we work together as a region to make life better, not only for our businesses, but our citizens? How do people stay in their homes like your neighbors for, for 400 years? How do people allow their homes to be inherited by their children and their children afford to live there? And I think it's sad that we see young people leaving our community because it's unaffordable. And one of those costs that's part of their consideration is water and sewer. So I, I, I'm thrilled that you're here and that you're listening to us. Um, as a small town with a rich history, we want this to continue. I want other families to have the same experience that my grandparents and my parents and I've had and my children have had. I want business owners to come here and be successful. I want them to have great relationships with the community. I want the tax revenue to help offset the cost to our residents. And we want a strong economy. But we can't do that unless we make sure that our infrastructure is reliable and will support that development. And that's where I think this is the opportunity for us to really rewrite our future for the next 50 to 75 years. And we do that by putting in an infrastructure that's going to sustain growth and it's going to sustain development that's going to provide us with a strong economy. Well said. And so we had a... Uh the economist in to see us uh, recently, uh, her name is Stephanie Kelton. I don't know if you might have heard of her or not. They're part of the modern monetary theory, et cetera. And uh, we all grew up with uh, kitchen table economics. You know, you, when you have a budget, you got to make ends meet and uh, you do everything you can to scrimp and save. And uh, at the end of the day, though, you got to balance that budget. And the same is true with municipalities, and the same is true of the state. The only entity that is capable of assisting 
uh, our states and our municipalities and subsequently our families is the federal government uh, because of uh, its ability to print currency. And I'm not saying that from the standpoint of just printing money, I think that gets over -gener generalized, but in terms of addressing what we all know is a D minus rating with regard to infrastructure, just, you know, you're living what that, is, what that is just with water. We haven't even talked about broadband and what that means for the future and that coming out here as well. So here again, it's gonna be up to the federal government to step up and ultimately the way that this gets paid and I think people increasingly have to look at that is not just taxes, et cetera, but also the productivity and resources that come from that and the economic growth that comes uh, from all of that. And uh, uh, that's why we're hopeful that we get a bipartisan solution instead of, you know, this endless taste great, less filling argument that goes on in Washington, DC. And, everybody scratches their head and says, for God's sake, we need your help. Can you guys get together and send us the money that we need? I mean, it's not like, you know, you're not doing your jobs here. You are, uh, but you know, where would you possibly find that money, you know, without having more people say,